right, hi. Hello. All familiar faces today, nice. Uh, I think most of us were there for the first yes. part, right? Except, uh, yeah. So the first part uh, on the series, we will look, uh, so the intent behind the series is largely exploring masculine and feminine as concept, psychological concepts and going beyond the, the regular gender identities that we associate them with and look at how do we, regardless of our biological sex, how do we hold masculine and feminine energies within us in various forms. It could be psychic energies, spiritual energies, even physical energies in men and women which are both masculine as well as feminine. So in the first part we looked at the archetypes of the anima and the animus. So anima is the, the collective feminine that all of us hold within us and the animus is the collective masculine that we hold within us. Now, uh, again, regardless of biological sex, both, all of us hold all, all of these. Uh, of course, we have preferences in terms of what kind of energies we tend to operate out of. So some of us operate more out of the anima or more out of the animus, as the case may be. Uh, it has to do to a great extent to, with the conditioning that we are brought up with. Uh, physiological factors also play a role. So it's it's a mixed bag of the environment as well as nature. We also spoke about the stages of anima development in terms of how collectively as a human race we have evolved from the anima archetype of Eve to and we're moving towards the archetype of the Sophia. Right? So Eve as anima is uh, supposed to be the collective consciousness of very um, innocent, nascent, in almost the infant feminine state and Sophia is wisdom and, and the whole collective journey of the human race as far as the feminine is concerned is to move from innocence to wisdom. Right? Along the way we have had several archetypes, if you look at Carl Jung and a few other people who have researched into this, the, the collective archetype has shifted from the Eve to Helen as in Helen of Troy to Mary, Mother Mary and it's moving in towards Sophia. So they've been tracking the anima through historical figures that have appeared, historical or even mythological figures that have appeared along the way. And the role of the anima, the, the anima in general is considered the seat of consciousness and spirituality in the human uh, sphere. The animus on the other hand, the masculine is the, is more the seat of execution. So the anima thinks up and creates and the masculine actually manifests and does things outside. So both are equally critical. So uh, today I wanted to explore a very uh, interesting uh, concept that uh, is called the heroine's journey, which evolved out of the hero's journey. Right? Uh, some of us are probably familiar with Joseph Campbell's uh, work as well. Right? So uh, Campbell was, I mean, he, he was many things including being an anthropologist and a cultural researcher and a mythologist. And uh, he studied a lot of myths around the world, myths, stories, even popular literature, movies, yeah. all kinds of stories. and he realized that in all kinds of human uh, drama, so to say, all the kind of stories that we say, including our own life stories sometimes, he realized there is a common pattern of that narrative, right? And which eventually, uh, uh, of course, uh, Campbell and a few others also propagated the concept of what's called the monomyth, that end of the day, all stories around the world are the same. No matter how different they appear to be, if you compare the, the, the crux of the storyline of a book or a movie or any other form of story that we hear, there is a central thread, a pattern which is pretty much the same. Right? And uh, that, that's what Campbell called the hero's journey. And uh, given that his research was largely around the male role, 
and uh, if you look at a lot of the uh, popular mythology around the world, Indian or Greek or uh, Roman mythology, South American mythologies, a lot of it is, is really about men be going into war and achieving things and it is not so much about women going out and doing too much. So, therefore, he called it the hero's journey. So, Campbell laid out uh, a 17 step, uh, not, not linear steps, but cycle steps in a cycle of what he called the monomyth. Several others worked on it along the way, uh, including Christopher Vogler. Uh, Christopher Vogler, in, in fact, is uh, he belongs to Hollywood. He's a screenwriter and he he vets stories for Hollywood movies and all of that. And uh, 2007, I think he worked on his version of the hero's journey, which is an abridged 12-step version. So, it's interesting to look at the steps and compare it with the common myths that we know of or the stories that we know of. All of this starts with what's called the ordinary world. So, the hero is born in a normal family and everything's hunky-dory, happy childhood and all of that or at least a steady childhood, if not a happy childhood, till there is a call to adventure. There is something that happens in the hero's life which shakes up things. So, if you look at multiple stories, like let's say if you have to look at uh, Ram in the Ramayana, yeah. right? brought up in a normal royalty household, seemingly happy life, till the time there is that call to adventure. Right? And the call to adventure in Ram's case comes in the form of going out there, he's challenged and he marries Sita and uh, wins her uh, as a so-called prize of the <laughs> matrimonial ceremony. And so, uh, so, there is that call to adventure. Very often, there is a refusal of the call. Right? So, so, multiple things happened in Ram's life in terms of adventure. First was the marriage to Sita. Second, when he came back and there was that non-acceptance from KK in terms of her being uh, the head queen and all of that. And then there was the challenge put to him saying, if you want to be king, you've got to fight and get it. And he refused the call at that point, right? He, he said, okay, I'm going to step back, I'm going to go out in the wild rather than fighting my own brother. Similar stories, if you look at even a typical fictional thing like Harry Potter, same story, born, happy parents, but of course the parents get killed. There's a call to adventure in terms of then you know, finding his place in the world given that he's living, living in a world of humans where he's supposed to be a wizard. And he's constantly being sought out by the the, his enemies. So, there is that call that comes in at that point. Right? And initially, in most cases, most of these stories, even if you look at Bollywood movie <laughs> stories, there is that resistance to the call saying, I don't want to do this. It's, I'm not happy about going on a war or fighting somebody. Right? However, in and, and we, well, one of the things that Campbell said and several other writers have also said is that the differentiation between a hero and a mortal, a normal human being is that the hero finally heeds the call. And a lot of us in our lives get the call, but we keep refusing it because we think it's too scary or too violent or we need to give up too much. And he says that's a differentiation between the hero and a, a, a regular human being. So, assuming the hero heeds the call, at some point in the story there is that meeting with the mentor. So, Ram meets Jatayu in the forest and then there are eventually others as well. He, he meets Hanuman and he meets several others. Uh, if you look at Harry Potter, Harry Potter meets Dumbledore and he is taken in. Lord of the Rings, uh, uh, what is his name, Frodo meets the, the bearded guy, <laughs> I forget his name. So, uh, Gandalf, yeah. So, th th there is that pattern in all of those stories where there is a mentor who appears when the hero decides, okay, I'm going to go ahead with the journey at some point. And uh, I can barely see this. Uh, yeah, so the next uh, piece is where he enters the threshold into the new world, 
new world as, as in whatever is the crux of that journey. So, Campbell calls the initial phase the phase of departure where at some point the person moves away from the regular part of life and then that initiation begins when he crosses the threshold. Right? So, Harry Potter's case for example, he there, there is that and uh, interestingly in, even in the book, there is a very clear th cross, literal crossing of the threshold when he runs into that station and the the uh, so there is the, the platform number is 9 and 3 fourths, right, which is supposed to be, so there is the regular London station which has platform 10, 9 and platform 10 and apparently all the wizards are expected to run into a wall and when they run into the wall, actually the wall dissipates and they enter on the uh, other side of the dimension which is the wizard world. So there is that literal crossing of the threshold that happens. In Ram's case, the crossing of the threshold was about leaving everything behind, stepping into the forest. The forest was the new world in his case. Right. Similarly, if you look at Mahabharata again, Krishna appears as the mentor when Arjun decides that I want to go into war. And then there is the of, uh, crossing of the threshold, he enters the battlefield at one point. Right. And then there are tests and enemies and allies. So some people like you, some people don't like you. So we have all these supporting characters in all of these stories which either support or go against the hero. Okay. And at some point there is that approach to what is called the innermost cave. The innermost cave is what is termed to be the greatest, darkest fear of the hero, the, the, the spot that he has been avoiding in terms of confrontation. Right? So Arjun decides to come into war and then when he actually sees his relatives, his mentors, his teachers on the other side, he, he has to get in touch with that innermost fear that I don't want to kill these people. Whether they are too dear to me and I cannot think of them as enemies. Right? Ram again is forced to confront that when Sita is taken away and he is still fighting that battle of what is right, what is wrong, how do I even work with the, uh, and, and he also approaches that way in that battle with Shurpanakha when there is a choice to kill and he says I cannot. So there is that morality versus ethics that, that comes up. Harry Potter, Frodo, all of them go through that space where they have to confront their own darkness. Harry Potter at some point realizes that the uh, Voldemort is his dark half, right? so for, for one to be killed, the other also needs to get killed. Similarly, Batman and Robin, if, you've, if you're familiar with that storyline. So they have to approach their darkest, darkest side, which in a way prohibits them from accepting the call early on. Right? Because somewhere there is that part of our intuition that says if you embark on this journey at some point you are going to confront your dark side, things that you don't like about yourself, they will all come to the fore for resolution. Your own dark side appearing in some yeah. other form. Appearing in some other form, appearing in the form of an enemy sometimes, uh, sometimes you are just left alone and you have to confront it and there is no other way out. So, because the dark side appears, you are in that what, what he calls the innermost cave, there is that ordeal, you go through a whole lot of dilemmas about what's right, what is wrong, who do I choose, who do I let go of. So, th there is a lot of decision making that happens in that process and so the ordeal could be in the form of a war, it could be in the form of a duel that's fought with somebody and end of it, there is reward. And because the hero has chosen to heed the call and go into the journey, at some point because he confronts the darker side, the energy of, a, of the darker side also merges in, into the person and therefore there is reward. Right? So for Ram the reward was getting Sita back, it was ultimately he was fighting for that. Right? So reward uh, in case of Harry Potter, it was finally Voldemort getting killed and Voldemort's powers going back into Harry Potter. Right? So the darker side merges back as the reward. 
and then there is that road back back home uh, so the process of initiation completes here and then there is the process of return home and at this point uh, uh, one of the things that happens along the way is the loss of innocence and that movement from innocence into wisdom because although the hero knows he is going back home the home is not the same again because he's a different person home has changed because of things that have happened right so there is the road back and and there is the resurrection because th there is a resurrection because he's not the old self anymore the old self is dead and somebody new is going back home so it's literally like the resurrection of the christ christ is dead but he comes back in a more evolved spiritual form and finally the last step is is the return into the world with what he terms the elixir elixir not in the sense of immortal but having come to one's full self and therefore leaving something for the world so immortality in terms of contribution to the world and not so much self as an personal physical self so the interesting thing about the monomyth is if we deconstruct pretty much any story around us a, a a movie a story book that we read a personal story that we hear pretty much all of them follow the same thing and therefore we, he calls it the monomyth that end of the day no matter how the nitty gritties look very different some may be rich some may be poor some live in luxury some don't end of the day the story is just the same for everybody it doesn't really matter who you are in the world so um when joseph campbell uh, published the hero's journey one of his students uh, maureen murdock who who was keenly following his work realized that yes while the hero's journey is valid for heroes it doesn't seem to capture a woman's journey because it's typically the male journey of the 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 man going out to war and conquering demons and coming back as the hero it, it doesn't seem to reflect journey of women around the world right and therefore she decided to look at what is the psycho spiritual journey of a woman and that got formulated as what she calls the heroine's journey which is the journey of the anima within us right our feminine side so the heroine's journey uh, uh maureen murdock says in our world in our given scheme of thing starts from shifting from feminine to the masculine right? uh, which she accounts for in terms of uh, the conditioning that we grow up with in a patriarchal society even if a girl is born the comparison is always with the boy right and it may not so much be at a personal level but at the larger collective so a lot of girls grow up with statements even if uh, you know parents are so called modern they, they grow up with statements saying you are my son it's not about saying you are my daughter and you're enough but you're like my son or you're equal to men so there is always that constant comparison with men and being feminine in itself is not considered enough and therefore the psyche shifts from feminine to the masculine so and that that that's true from a, at a psychological level that's true for most women across the world today that they operate more from the masculine than from the feminine side right and because there is that shift from the inner strength you see you're operating as masculine and not claiming your femininity there is the road of trials so you, there is fight right and there is that illusion of success so illusion of success could be in the form of corporate success it could be high achievement in professions it could be a uh, success even in the form of a good homemaker doing good things children doing well so there is a lot of the the shift from the feminine to the masculine is largely termed as a shift from being to doing and therefore the road of trial is about doing more and more and really pushing your boundaries there 
and therefore there is illusion of success so you might achieve a great position in your corporate life you might achieve great things for your children you might manage an impeccable household right but at some point when you're at the peak of success there is loss of meaning and therefore there is that descent that happens so you start off on the masculine front and at some point when you're at the deepest because at some point you realize there is no end to that success but and that can happen to me, hero's journey also. yes so the hero also carries the anima right so it, it's possible so with both of them but uh, uh, what Maureen Murdoch meant by saying the heroine's journey is different is because for the hero that separation doesn't happen Achha. the heroine's journey is literally about claiming her femininity the hero's journey is more about living the masculine. Be uh, there is no conflict in the Yeah, because the hero is not challenged saying, you know, when, when it's a child, the child is not say, told, okay, you're only a boy or you're equal to a girl. That's never told to a boy. The girl is always told you're equal to a boy. So, so personality clashes in context. Yes. So the hero lives as the masculine and therefore the journey is different as compared to the, the heroine where she, because the shift is from the core of your being right at the beginning, the whole journey is just about getting back to yourself and not anywhere else. For the hero, it's about getting out there in the world and conquering it. For the woman, it's about getting within and reclaiming it and not conquering so much. So, hence she pointed out that the hero and the heroine's journeys are very different. Right? And we see that, that that's uh, movement from illusion of success to the descent you would see that in a lot of women in the corporate worlds reaching top position and then saying what am I gaining out of this and then stepping out and saying let me do something more meaningful uh, not just women a lot of men get up there and say what am I doing this for right and, and that, that's the heroine's journey within the man the anima journeying within the man and saying where is meaning in all of this Right. So that, that's rock bottom and it can be a very dark space because that, that's a space for all of us where we are trying to figure out what am I doing in life. Realizing suddenly what we yeah. are. So yeah, we, we have achieved a lot in the external sense of the term but then what does that mean to us? as an individual is there meaning for us is something that we all question and that that's the dark dark night of the soul as it's termed right? and then the, in that f uh, search for meaning there is the next step of meeting with the goddess so I mean it, it, she didn't mean it in the religious sense of the term but meeting with the goddess in terms of connecting with the inner feminine the anima Right? Because so far it's the animus operating and saying, let's go out, establish things in the world, conquer things in the world. And at some point the animus comes down to say, okay, I've conquered it all, now what? And that now what leads to the connection, reconnection with the inner anima, the inner feminine, which says, okay, <laughs> there is more to life than achievement, so what else is there? And that happens in multiple ways for multiple people. It could be in a, a, through a so-called spiritual journey. It could be uh, for a lot of people it happens because there's a major shake-up or an accident or trauma that happens in life that makes you question everything. And then you start trying to live in a more meaningful, balanced way. And that balance is achieved through the reconciliation with the feminine to say, okay, I've ignored this part of life often and typically the feminine parts of life are the creative aspects, the arts, the culture, the uh, simple aspects like nurturing, gardening, the, those aspects of life you go back into the yeah. earth uh, uh, in terms of connecting with the earth and because there is that reconciliation with the feminine at some point the, there is that inner wedding so to say, where you reincorporate the masculine because at this point the masculine seems absolutely worthless. At this point, because the feminine is in more balance, now the masculine can come back in a more uh, stronger way with the feminine not, and not 
alone as the so masculine. Yeah. So then the final stage, therefore, in the heroine's journey is that of balance, the, what she terms the sacred union, is just the balance between the anima and the animus. Okay. So um, I thought it's an interesting uh, concept to explore in the sense all of us go through both the hero's journey as well as the heroine's journey in, in different stages of life. Right? And while the hero's journey is constantly about achievement and conquering and coming back, the heroine's journey is more the inner journey and this is more often than not this is the lonely journey because there's no one out there, the entire journey is inward whereas the hero's journey is outward. So a lot of our achievements out in the world are our hero's journeys and a lot of our spiritual realizations are inside us as the heroine's journey. So all of us undertake both those journeys equally. Most like uh, conquering or yes. Like, and after that realization. Yes. True. Yeah. So you see that in individuals as well as in the collective. Yeah, so if you look at the 1920s, 30s, 40s, there was a lot of the masculine journey happening in the collective. So there were wars and everyone was fighting everybody, there were struggles all over the place. And at some point when the hero came back home, there was that realization that <laughs> what is home? I mean, it's not as great as we thought it was. So then there was the Cold War and there was not so great times when you talk of the 50s and the 60s because while people fought wars and won, there was nothing much to really look forward to in terms of coming back home because you had to deal with the atom bomb in Japan, you had to deal with other things all around the world. Germany was reeling under debt. So all around the world there was that shake-up happened where the hero came back home but then there was loss of meaning that what did we do this for? Because there was too much of the hero here. And at some point, and therefore, at the collective level, we saw that shift in terms of the, the hippie movement happening around the 60s, 70s, the, the, all the flower power and uh, the new age spirituality stuff, which was that process of reconnecting with the feminine to say, stop war because it's, it, it isn't achieving much for us. Although we are back home, home doesn't mean anything more. So therefore, that process at the collective level, if we look at it, the last few years have been this journey of reincorporating the feminine and the then reconnecting with the masculine from a more balanced feminine space and not from the uh, in, impoverished, so to say, feminine space where the feminine is rejected. And therefore, uh, when, the, when we're talking in terms of the feminine rising yeah, around the planet in the feminine as in the feminine consciousness rising, it is that journey that's currently happening in terms of more and more people getting in touch with yeah, harmony and peace and uh, if you see a lot of career choices of youngsters now, all of them want to travel and do more meaningful things, they, they don't want that you know, 12 hour corporate job, a lot of them are saying they'd rather work on their own and earn whatever little they earn and not really look at getting stuck in a typical corporation. So their demands are very different of a workspace also. Relationships accordingly are also shifting in terms of the, the traditional system of marriage getting questioned and newer alternatives getting explored. There are countries like Iceland which they've published data recently saying we don't want to get married as a society so why, why do we even have the system of marriage? So the, all of that is getting questioned in terms of the achievement orientation to balance orientation happening outside of us in the collective and I'm sure that's getting enabled because all of us are going through the same journey individually in our own ways. And I find that amazing to think of it that no matter how difficult we think our individual journeys are, end of the day it's the same journey for everybody all at once. So sometimes it's, uh, I find this also a good reflection tool psychologically to look at once in a while to say okay where am I on this journey in a particular relationship I yeah either I am into being more or doing more yeah 
you know, so uh, sometimes I use this, uh, you know, in coaching and things like that. Where I use this just to reflect on saying, okay, in this particular relationship with this person, where am I on the journey? Or in relationship with, let's say, money, where am I on this journey? Or in relationship with building a house, where am I on the journey? And it it's interesting because it gives you clues as to what needs to get balanced now. Or what's the next step on the cycle? I wouldn't really think of them as opposites. They are, yeah, I mean, they're complementary energies, they're complementary psychic energy. So it's not like black and white. It's just <laughs> it's, it's complementing. Yes, and it's perfectly possible to have both operating at the same time. So it's not an either or. Or one giving away for the other and simultaneously. It's more, I mean, I, I, the best way to explain for me, I find the archetype of the Ardhanarishwar, the hermaphrodite, being that perfect thing, saying both exist at the same time. So it's not one or the other, it's always one and the other. So it's not about rejecting one to bring up the other. You need both of them equally. One giving way to the other and no. No, not really. It's it's walking together. So you it's may sometimes overpower one. Yes, at I mean that moment. sometimes because of conditioning or because of personal choices, we are taught not to, not to give way to the other, right? I'm not saying that way. You will say that. It's at, at a point, one is dominant, then... Yeah, the but it's like dancing together. So, yes, somebody leads at one point, somebody leads at the other point, yes. You know, it's like you know, the, the, the feminine aspect of us, the psych, psychic feminine energy comes up with ideas, is the creative one. But you need the masculine to go out and execute those ideas. I mean, too much of the feminine is not good either. Because you're not doing anything, you, you can't sustain it. Momentum is not good. Yeah. So you need both and you, they both need to dance together. Unfortunately, we, because of the, the whole patriarchal mode at the collective level, there has been that ignoring of the feminine that that has happened. So uh, we've seen over the years that arts education wasn't particularly encouraged. You were told that that's not really a great way of making money or aggression is encouraged. You're told you can't be meek. So th there is that whole comparative state of the world that we were brought into, which was the too much of the masculine, which is too much of the doing. And at some point, you had to come back into balance and say both are equally important. So one down to here. Sure. I don't know to what extent the patriarchal society is contributing to it. Mm -hmm. Because we have patriarchal societies, the mm -hmm. Nayas, for instance. Yes. They should case it for one yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there also this will be Yes, because if you look at the larger collective consciousness of the humans, the but entire the planet is. put together, the larger collective is the patriarchal collective, right? And it's now slowly balancing out. So yes, we've had pockets of matriarchal societies. In India, if you look at it, Kerala has a matriarchal background, Tripura has a ma matriarchal Tripura. background, uh, some parts of Kurg have a matriarchal society. But those are very small pockets and uh, see the impact of this on the world is at the level of the collective and not necessarily only the individual. So it's not that we've not had people you know, living in the flow, it's not like we've not had artists in the world, musicians in the world, they've been there, the feminine energies have been there. But if you look at the larger collective, it's been the masculine. So, I mean, if you look at the collectivity of consciousness, Carl Jung speaks about, uh, he draws it from the, the Vedantic literature, where he says there is the Atman, which is the self, individual consciousness, right? And there is the Paramatman, which is the collective consciousness. So, we hold a consciousness which is within us as individuals, but we are also influenced by the collective human consciousness, right? which we draw upon very often and which is how we experience things which we may not have physically had exposure to and he calls them the archetypes. Right? Where he says, for example, uh, uh, somebody who has been brought up as an orphan, for example, 
if you tell him mother, the person has a concept of a mother. Where does he draw it from? I mean, he, he may not have personally experienced the mother, but there is something in the collective that he is able to draw up from. And therefore, when the term mother is used or when the term doctor is used, there is a certain expectation that springs up regardless of whether we've had experience with that person or not. Okay? So when we, if I say that, use the term nurse, you're very likely to think about a kind lady in service and not a rude you know, a person walking around with a stick because that, that's the collective archetype of the nurse. Right? It's possible that one odd nurse may not fit that criteria, but in the larger collective, that's what we draw from. Right? Like if you look at the archetype of the politician today, the collective archetype is of corruption. Right? So even if a very nice politician were to come to us today, we, we respond with skepticism because we are drawing from the collective, not from the individual. So we are hugely influenced. By it. Somewhere these lines and restrictions are getting blurred mm -hmm. because of late in the USA, mm -hmm. the women soldiers are allowed to join the combat troops. Yes. Yeah. Things are getting blurred. Yeah, things are shaking up in a big way at this point. You know, if you look at what Donald Trump seems to be doing to the US is literally shake, br bringing to the fore the human. Everything that we need to really work upon is being brought to the fore, is surfacing it for people to take it up and resolve for themselves. So, I mean, in that sense, if you look at his consciousness, he is doing great service to the world by bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's necessary to confront that. That's the part of the hero's journey, right? You have to get into that innermost cave. And for US as a collective now, Trump is bringing up that innermost cave and saying, hey, this is where we are. Address it at some point. Yes. So I mean, the collective hero of the US at this point is going through that cave to see well, what, can, what emerges at the other side of it. So it's going to be interesting in the next few years to see where that shift leads us. Interestingly, to end with, so, so when Maureen Murdoch went to Campbell in 83 and she told him that, you know, I'm not satisfied with your hero's journey, so here is my model of the heroine's journey. Uh, this is what Campbell said. His response was that women don't need to make the journey. Because in the whole mythological journey, the woman is there. All she has to do is realize that she is the place that people are trying to get to. And if you look at most myths, mm. Sita is just there. <laughs> Everybody else is fighting <laughs> for her. Sita yeah. Or yeah, Sita, or there is Draupadi, or there is Mary Magdalene, <laughs> there is, uh, in Helen case of, of Harry Potter, there is, yeah, there is Helen of Troy. All of them are just there and everyone's fighting around them, right, it was Rapunzel, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, Campbell's response to that is that it's not so much the cause as much as the destination, the, the, the fact that we've, we start the journey having moved away from the anima, from the feminine, the whole fight is to really get back to that aspect of ourselves, it's not so much for the other person or it's not so much about fighting for a wife or a partner or any of that. It's, it's about fighting for that part of ourselves which we seem to have lost. And therefore, the energy for the journey comes from some knowingness that there is that part of us which we need to get back. And the journey, the entire drama, the story is about just getting back that inner small part of us that we've lost. So, I find that concept very interesting and it's a good tool to reflect on, I mean just to look at the journey cycle and see where are we in different areas of our lives. It gives us a lot of clue in terms of how do we deal with our inner masculine and inner feminine, what do we give more power to. And it's great if it's a conscious choice, most often it's, it's an unconscious choice we, that we choose the feminine or the masculine one over the other, whereas it's important to maintain both equally well. Because it, it helps us uh, to, give a, to see the broad picture. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And and use the whole of us, right? We we're not complete unless we are using all all of our energies. So the journey is not so much about being out there and achieving as much as completing integration of all parts of self, the dark side, the light side, all of that put together. So that's uh, that for today. A uh, couple of books you might find interesting if you're into reading. Uh, one is of course Maureen Murdoch's Heroine's Journey, with where she documented this entire process. Uh, the Thousand Faces is a very interesting one by jo Joseph Campbell, one of his seminal works where he compares mythologies from around the world and through that he arrives at the hero's journey to say that look at all these stories, they all have the same pattern. So that's a pretty interesting one. And Christopher Vogler, of course, that's a recent uh, one where he spoke about, he wrote about the writer's journey. He says, well, and the, the way they've been using that to create successful movies in Hollywood is to look at, does the movie script follow some journey pattern? Because if it doesn't follow, it, it's unlikely to land on the audience because people don't connect with the story then. At, at a very deep level, people connect with the story when there is, the journey is complete. And unknowingly, they reflect. Yes. Which is why if you look at a lot of offbeat movies, People yes. don't connect with it we as much the, because yeah. the, the, the journey is not People complete. People may see that uh, like an art movie and all this, hmm. but ultimately, uh, over, uh, I mean, uh, in a larger interest, it is not successful. Yes, because the collective the accepts collective. when the journey is complete. So they, he, he, a lot of Volger's work, Volger's work has been about vetting Bollywood scripts to say, how do we change it to make sure the journey is complete. That is a somewhere. Uh, Film critics say, no, whatever the this thing, success of film is, it should have a good story, mm. and uh, all family put together. Mm. If they are seeing that movie, the uh, movie will be there. Yes, yeah. So they identify all of them identify it together with the story. Yes. So yeah, I mean, that, that's what we call the, the formula in Bollywood <laughs> is, is, the, is the writer's journey. Thank you. Very right, much. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Good.